Welcome back to the Building the New World Conference, everyone. Tonight, we are doing Sector 7, Health and Wellness, and with us is Dr. Gabriel Cousins, who is a leading holistic physician with a special focus in live food, vegan diet, detoxification, and also healing diabetes. He is a psychiatrist, a family therapist, and a functional medicine doctor who received his MD from Columbia Medical School, and he completed his psychiatry residency in 1973. He also founded the Tree of Life Foundation, which has 32 centers around the world. He personally directs the Tree of Life Center located in Patagonia, Arizona, a yoga and detoxification retreat center that also offers training in live vegan farming and holistic technology for communities. In addition, Dr. Gabriel is the author of numerous books on vegan nutrition, but also other health topics. Two of his books are entitled Depression Free for Life and Creating Peace by Being Peace. Dr. Cousins embraces an interfaith worldview as a yoga adept with 18 years of spiritual discipline and study with two Indian masters. He also is an ordained rabbi and he's a practitioner of Native American, Taoist, and Essene traditions. Dr. Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us tonight at BTNW 2020. Well, I'm very happy to be here and to share with your community. Now, what are we sharing? We're really sharing the holistic liberation way, which clearly includes a lot about nutrition, but keeping in mind, you can't eat your way to God. So we have to kind of, but what we eat can dramatically improve our quality of life and our ability to become a superconductor of the divine, which is key to spiritual life and really liberation. So that's kind of where the, the bigger picture is, is happening in that way. So we'll be covering kind of all of those angles. And I'm actually going to start more with the spiritual aspect and then work into the the nutritional, spiritual nutritional aspect. Uh, I were actually brought in uh, 1982, and more actively in 1986, the whole, idea, the whole idea of spiritual nutrition. Up until that time, although obviously for thousands of years it's been mentioned, in our American culture, it wasn't particularly focused on. The focus was on nutrition, uh, live food, veganism rather than wait that's good and it's good for your health but what's the purpose of life is it about how long you can live or is it about reconnecting and deepening our connection with the divine and for me it's the latter it's about deepening deepening our connection with the divine and ultimately becoming one with the with the divine so in my newest book called Into the Nothing, I'll just hold it up there, okay? It is about living in a way, I call it the holistic liberation way, that helps us fully wake up and become liberated if, if that's our destiny. So that's the focus. Uh, of where I'm going with it. So where I'm going is keeping our mind in the bigger picture and using nutrition to support that bigger picture. So uh, does that give a feeling for what we're doing here? So now I think we're gonna begin the lecture, uh, I believe, and there we go. Liberated vegan for me, uh, that's a kind of fun thing, but the the idea really is, uh, although we can't eat our way to God, our diet supports our overall spiritual life and holistically our overall life. So next slide. Okay, so that's me at my home here in Patagonia, Arizona. 
there is snow on those mountains. And I'm sitting in full lotus on a little, a little pillar. It's uh, uh, kind of capturing the essence of this lifestyle. Next slide. And here's the thing. Uh, this is why health is so important. This is a, a Greek teaching. When health is absent, wisdom can't reveal itself. Art can't manifest. Strength can't fight. Wealth becomes useless. And intelligence cannot be applied. And we can see that in our society today. Because that's what is happening. Intelligence can't be applied. And I'm assuming here, the group I'm speaking with, is that we indeed are able because of our lifestyles, to apply and function intelligently for ourselves and in the world. Okay, next. So, Tree of Life Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, organization that carries out most of my work. We have programs in 42 different countries, a lot around uh, Organic, vegan, vegan nutrition and prevention of diabetes uh, and healing of diabetes naturally. So that's what uh, is the essence of the foundation. Next. And that's us. Uh, we have over 112, actually more than that at this point. And as I mentioned, 42 different countries. So we keep expanding. Next. So our topic today is spiritual nutrition, kundalini, liberation, a, a holistic way of living that takes us to liberation, or at least enhances our spiritual life. And that's uh, really the essence of so the next slide. So it's not like this is a new idea. The Basha, a great 17th century mystic, lived from 1698 to 1760. He said, when the body ails, the soul too is weakened, and one is unable to pray properly, even when clear of sins. Thus, you must guard the health of your body very carefully. Pretty clear statement. Uh, his successor said it this way, a small hole in the body causes a big hole in the soul. And Moses Maimonides, the great mystic uh, physician, rabbi in the 12th century, said, the welfare of the soul can only be achieved after attending to the welfare of the body. So contrary to some of, let's say, the Eastern traditions, which focus just about uh, limited spiritual life in that way, we include, I include, the total holistic approach, which is what our talk is about today. Next. So these are some of the very great Eastern uh, teachers, and enlightened teachers. And one of the things all of these have in common is they, uh, as a precursor, people had to develop different qualities because character is a very important part of spiritual life. Uh, so that's like a foundation. So I won't mention all these, but Shankaracharya, and Ramakrishna, Ramana Maharshi. So these are, they all set, taught the same thing. Get your foundation first, build your character. So we're going to talk about that first. Particularly in our world today, building your character is really important. Next slide. So they all taught, this is uh, traditional Vedic teachings about the four virtues. And the first is Viveka. That's the ability to tell the difference between the real and the temporal reality. Now, we can see in today's world, people are taking the temporal reality, politics and so forth, as if it's life-threatening and willing to even harm each other. But from a spiritual point of view, that's not really what life is about. Life is about knowing God. 
So that's the absolute reality versus the temporal reality. So vivekya is something that needs to be cultivated if we're going to be focusing on spiritual life and not on all the differences in, uh, of politics and belief systems. Next slide. As part of that, we call it viragya or equal vision. That really means to see each person equally that we see the, the soul of that person equal among all people. It's not focused on skin differences, gender differences, things like that. No, in spiritual life, that's uh, pretty much irrelevant. What counts is the radiance of your soul and to see all souls equally as a spark of the divine. Again, this is something that would make a huge difference in our society if people could begin to remember and actually tune into those, uh, the, to this principle of equal vision. Next slide. Now the divine urge is your desire for God. And it's the, it's something that uh, at different levels people have. And if you don't have it, that's okay because knowing it's important to have it, you can begin to work on it. But what we find is a lot of people involved in spiritual life really do have that. They, they have this inner push to know God. It's something you're more, you're more born with, but it can be developed. Very important virtue, Mamuk Shatra. Okay, next slide. Now, these are qualities, okay? Samadhi, Shakta, Sampati, they call the six attainments, and they're pretty basic. So the next slide is shama or control over the mind. Now, if people had control over the minds, this world we're living in, and in this country, would be very different. What we see is people have lost control over their minds. The media is controlling the mind. Emotions are controlling the mind. Belief systems are controlling the mind. It's like we need to regain control over our mind. And also the food we eat affects our mind too. Junk food tends to create a junk food mind. And healthy food tends to create a clear and balanced mind. So control over the mind becomes essential in a world that's in a sense lost control over their minds. And that means they're it's uh, vulnerable to whatever inputs are going in without having the inner control. Next slide. So Dhamma is control over the sense organs. And again, we're seeing uh, in America kind of a inability to go beyond our immediate gratification needs. And in spiritual life, we, we need to be able to focus our energy on uh, the bigger picture and not be uh, caught in uh, just our sense needs. Doesn't mean we don't take care of our sense needs, but we're not controlled by them. Next. Now, one of the other things we call uparati, but it's 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 the ability to balance the dualities in your life: joy and grief, and praise and blame, good and bad. They're actually integrated at a higher level, but people have broken them down. So we have good and bad, you're either good or you're bad. It's not like, oh wait, we're a complexity of all these things. And so uh, when you don't have that balance, uh, life is simple, but actually not very evolved in the situation. You have the good or bad, well, that's not the way it really is. We're a mix. Next slide. And that's the spiritual teaching. Uh, Tatiksha is, I'm going to use the word forbearance. It's like life is hard. It's not so easy these days. And it's holding firm. Why I really our whole culture is experiencing a, whole, a very much difficulty on, on every aspect. 
and that takes us back to understanding is whatever God does is for the best. So we can step back and say, well, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to have a positive attitude. I know this is for the best. Let me see how this could be for the best of my life and how I can work with it that it helps me focus on the best. Next slide. Now, this is faith. Now, what, 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 what do we mean by faith? So faith is faith, faith in the truth, which is we are the image of God dancing on the planet. So it's having that faith that we are divine beings and meant and put on the planet to evolve spiritually. Next slide. Samadana means focusing on the truth rather than politics or sex or whatever. All those play a role, but keeping our focus on the truth is the most important. Next slide. And along with this, I call it spiritual courage. It takes a lot of courage in our society to stand up for your truth. When the society says, well, if you don't believe the way we want you to believe, then you're going to get penalized. And that also takes us to the spiritual honor, which is a way of living your life in a way that is really honoring and uplifting all of life. Next slide. Uh, in all spiritual life, we have to make a certain amount of money to support it. So classic spiritual teachings validate one has to make a good living. And then with that, we have morals and ethics, which is kind of a guideline that holds, it's a baseline that kind of holds society together so that we have some foundation to rise up with. Next slide. So part of the spiritual path is studying the wisdom text, uh, meditating on it, then pondering it. And along with that is with the wisdom text, with spiritual teachers, with your collective feedback, it, it gives us a chance to look at old negative patterns, thought forms, and begin to work on them. Next slide. Now, willingness to live as a slave is a kind of a, a little bit of play on words, but because it's a slave to the truth, staying in the truth, even though it may be easier to go along with the crowd, willingness to stay in the truth and be connected to the divine laws is really quite important. And in that way, we begin to see the world as a reflection of the divine and there's one other piece to it. It's a Native American teaching, Lakota, we call Omatakuasa, which means uh, everything is our relative. The earth, living earth is a relative. The plant people are our relatives. Uh, animal world are relatives and the humans are our relatives. So it's a, it's a, it's a relationship uh, with all of creation that elevates us. That's very much part of the Lakota uh, Native American way. Okay, next slide. So this is a, a tricky concept. Koakame de ma, power of similitude. What it means is we are constantly alternating, if we understand quantum physics, between the nothing and the something. And that's going back and forth. So it gives us the remembrance that even though we think we're the something, we're really merged into the nothing. And then we emerge out of the nothing, back into the nothing, and there's this flow that goes on. That's why my book is called In the Nothing, because we sometimes forget that that's part of the truth. We're part of the bigger whole or nothingness, which really does make a difference. And the power of what is something like that. It means uh, seeing the light of God in all things. And that activates the spark 
of God's girlfriend. Now that's a way of being in the world, and I'm going to say it a different way. That's called eros. Most people think eros is like uh, more sexual, but the deeper eros is passionately seeing the play of God and, and relating to the play of God with passion in all of creation. So it opens up a much bigger way of being in the world. Next slide. And then understanding with that, that there's only God. And I say it in a variety of ways. It's really seeing the love of God in all things. In the East, we call it uh, non-dual, or Vedanta, seeing the oneness. And with that comes spiritual joy. And spiritual joy is really important in the whole big picture because if anything we're doing, how we're eating, how we're living, if it's not really done with joy, it doesn't really have... The, the big power. When we add joy to everything, it makes a, a very big difference in the quality of our life. And that brings the arrows again. Next slide. Now, there are levels of what I call spiritual maturation. People could be very much involved in just ceremony, and that's, uh, that's going to be good and work for them. And, India, we call it Shiva Yupaya, or they can be involved in love of God, which is still dual. And finally, what we call Anupaya or Akdut, which is just the direct knowing of God. So there are levels, and they, they all really work together, but we start often with ceremony and we go deeper into love of God and eventually oneness. So there's a flow there in this, in this way. Next slide. So that's me this year. Uh, one of the things you want to do and why it's good to have a, for me, like a 99% live food, 100% vegan diet, is you maintain a certain amount of flexibility and strength. Very, very important uh, in, the, in the bigger picture. Next slide. So now we're moving into what I call the six foundations, which is a way of life, a holistic liberation way that can lead us to liberation. And the one we're going to spend the most time on is how to eat in a way, become a superconductor of the divine. I'm going to run through all of them briefly and then come back to that. So, but what I will say, it's a hundred percent vegan diet, at least 80% live food diet with spiritual fasting uh, seven days, twice a year. We do have a spiritual fast coming up in another week over the internet, which is an interesting way to do things. So that's key, and we will come back to it. Now, the next foundation, next slide, is building the prana, chi or nefesh, tai chi, chi gong, uh, classical yoga asana, they all build that energy so that expands our consciousness in that way. Next slide. Okay. Service and charity. The key is that service and charity or karma yoga does need to be done with joy. That's the key. Next slide. So if we are fortunate and we're looking, we can uh, we, it's extremely helpful to have a spiritual teacher, but you have to be ready for it. And I looked many years, my, one of my two gurus, he spent 25 years looking for a spiritual teacher. This is us obviously seeing a sunset. I'm a little bit on the, slightly to the right with a, a blue shawl there. As we're appreciating the energetics of the sunset. Next slide. Uh, now, Shakti Pot is the transmission of <clears throat> the spiritual energy that helps awaken. In the East, we call it Kundalini. In the West, we may call it the Ruach HaKadash, or Holy Spirit. But it's the ability to awaken that energy in people. Now, it's stored at the base of the spine. 
And with the touch, if I look, or by sound, we can help awaken it. I have been uh, empowered by my spiritual uh, teachers to be a vehicle of this Shaktipat energy, this Ruha Kadesh, to help awaken people. Uh, and when that Kundalini is awakened, that's the, the last major step in spiritual life. And it's not the end, it doesn't mean you're liberated, but it's the last major step. And then it's supporting that unfoldment. And the six foundations uh, that I'm describing are all designed to support that unfoldment. So that's a, a very uh, important thing. Each uh, Monday through Fridays at around 9 o'clock a.m. Arizona time, I give a uh, Shakti pot over the internet and we meditate for 10 minutes. And then there's a little talk. <clears throat> so it's available even over the internet. It works pretty well. And so that's what we're doing. And each month I have meditation, Shakti pot meditation retreats, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, once a month. So it's still accessible over the internet uh, to, to help people uh, continue the spiritual life or, or get more involved in spiritual life. But it's fundamental, both in Eastern and Western traditions. In the Western tradition, less people know about it, but Moses uh, touched and gave the energy to Yehoshua, and the spirit was in it. That was Deuteronomy 34 9. So it's right there in black and white uh, in terms of it in the Western tradition as well. It doesn't just belong to yoga in the Eastern tradition. Very important part of spiritual life. Uh, again, the great teachers, particularly the East, say that spiritual life doesn't even begin until the Kundalini is awake. And that's the spiritualizing force in all creation and in us it's stored at the base of the spine and when it's awakened it begins to move out through the whole body through what we call the subtle energetic channels called the nadis 72,000 of them but three main ones which we'll talk about a, a little bit later so that's the importance of the cooking awakening is, is that just takes you to the next level of spiritual life uh, and spiritual evolution. Next slide. So now that we've kind of covered that bigger picture, I'm going to mention one more thing, the importance of meditation, very much part of what I do when I teach. Uh, meditation isn't just quieting the mind. It's actually quite the mind so we can go beyond the mind into the truth of who we are. So that's a, a kind of a deeper level of discussing what meditation is. Now, the question is why live foods? And the first thing about live foods, it's got the most energy. It's an unbroken ecological uh, uh, wholeness. And it gives us the highest amount of biophoton energy, which is how we can measure the energy in food. So, and in our cells. So, uh, Dr. Fritz Pop, who's still alive from Germany, uh, pretty much uh, described it and actually has a has a way to measure it. But basically, what he found was this little machine. In fact, one of his people came to my office and wanted to measure my biophoton energy. It was kind of funny, but a person eating junk food has about a thousand units. A person eating cooked organic food has 23,000 units that's measured in the body. A newborn baby has 43,000. A person having live uh, eating primarily a live food diet has 83,000 units. And if you're really fully live food and taking certain herbs, which we'll talk about a little later, your biophoton energy could be as high as 116,000. So it makes a difference. 
And so I've added the different herbs that are, are good, which a little bit later. Now, what all this is doing is all this energy is building your subtle organizing energy fields, which are the fields that surround our whole body, uh, surround our organs, surround our cells, and bring order uh, to our cells uh, and health. Next. Now, calorie restriction was uh, a concept developed by Dr. Stephen Spindler. They, uh, he worked with uh, mice, and he found that when he cut their uh, food intake by 40%, there was a 100% increase in the anti-aging genes. So the less you eat, the longer you live. So he, he was just, in a sense, proving it. Now, when you're eating live foods, you're getting all the minerals you need to uh, make your cell memory, because the, the, the cell is like a battery, and you're getting the minerals and coenzymes and enzymes to help maintain a high function of your cell memory, and therefore of your battery, okay? And Dr. Kolath from Sweden found that when people went to live food, there was a generalized genetic upgrade. So they're finding the same kind of thing. The live food upgrades the overall function of the genes. Next slide. Okay. And Dr. Howell talks about enzyme preservation. When you don't cook the food, you don't destroy the enzymes. Live food is also alkalizing and mineralizing. And our diet today tends to be just the opposite. And so most people are too acidic, so their bodies don't work at the highest level. Uh, zeta potential is quality of water. And the higher the quality and frequency of the water, the uh, higher the zeta potential. Now, what we find when people are doing live vegan food is the bowel toxicity is decreased. Well, what do I mean by that? Uh, on live food, it takes somewhere between 24 and 36 hours to get the food through the bowel and out, whereas on cooked food, it's 40 to 100 hours. So uh, it's less in your body and therefore less uh, chance of the toxic buildup. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay. So cooked food tends to exhaust our enzymes, and enzymes are, are, are part of our life force. Uh, now, I also see that live food is a means of taking the outer light, like the sunlight, moving it into vegetables, leafy greens, and so forth. When we eat it, then that sunlight energy is directly released into us. So it's a, a way of getting the, from the outer light to the inner light. And throughout history, we look at vegan, also live food, as the best diet for supporting spiritual life and thus holistic liberation. Next slide. So I'm going to just show some pictures because it makes it more believable. So these are two cabbage leaves. This is Korean photography. And what we see here is a cooked cabbage leaf and a raw cabbage leaf. There's obviously a big energetic difference. Next slide. So this is a lemon. You can see all the energy coming out of it. Next slide. And this is a sprout, a radish sprout. Again, you can see the energy coming out of it. It's really amazing to see. Next slide. And this is uh, an, another radish sprout, slightly different camera setup, but obviously energy coming out of it. Next slide. This is a corn sprout. Next slide. This is cacao. And people have different feelings about cacao, but uh, what I've seen in the research and the use of it is it, it really does support your overall vitality improves brain and heart circulation, improves function of brain and heart, as well as 
uh, supports the spiritual life. So cacao actually is a, a real good thing to add into your diet. Pretty impressive picture. Next slide. So this is uh, the same person on the left is eating a uh, organic cooked diet. On the right, it's a junk food cooked diet. Obviously, there's not much. These are fingerprints, really. It's not much, obviously, energy coming out of his fingers on the a junk food diet. Just making the point. Next slide. This is the uh, pineal gland, the white uh, point there, and it's you can see it's filled with a tremendous amount of light. We are light beings. The next slide is the pituitary gland, the blue radiance. So these are the master glands and they're uh, radiating a great deal of light. Next slide. And this is uh, adrenaline. You can see it's almost well three and a half times, which is like the Kundalini is at the base of the spine. Next slide. This is uh, testosterone. It's kind of angular and sharp. Next slide. And this is uh, estrogen, a little bit rounded, but the hormones have energies and frequencies as well. Next slide. Now, here's the point. I said it before. You can't eat your way to God. But a 95%, and I even say 80% diet uh, is a powerful way to transform yourself into being a superconductor of the divine. And that's really the key, key idea. Uh, and moving in away from the illusion of separation and of I am this, into oneness. Next slide. So what we're basically saying is on all levels, uh, live foods charge the cells, live foods activate the cell as a battery and bring a tremendous amount of life force into the body. That's the key teaching. And that light and light force is what empowers uh, the flow of the spiritual energy in our body. Next slide. And this is uh, Sri Prabhupada, uh, founder of the uh, International Society of Krishna Consciousness. And notice he doesn't say dairy. And in getting people who knew him, he basically said, you don't need dairy, as he says, if you can maintain it, a raw fruits and vegetables are the best diet for human beings. So even though they add dairy in the Eastern tradition because they don't have much B12, we can get that more easily here. So that's, that's a key uh, concept there. Next slide. Okay, and further support about a life of diet. This is Gandhi, Genesis 129, 30. And God said, behold, I give you every herb yielding seed which is upon the face of the earth. And every tree, of which is the fruit of a tree yielding uh, seed, for you it should be fruit. So, for multiple areas, uh, we have uh, the focus on a vegan life and diet as being the best for spiritual life. Next slide. And this is a Taoist perspective. They are also, since uh, 475 BC, uh, promoting a live food diet. So what they say, if you mix and smoke and fire, in other words, cook your food, your body will not walk in the jewel pond. The jewel pond is the symbol for liberation. So that's the Taoist approach. Next slide. So what uh, I'm saying is we have the uh, Torah or biblical approach with the Taoist approach, we have the yogic approach, and they're all saying the same thing. The importance of live food you diet, as I say, at least 80% and then 100% vegan. So this is a model, the cover of my book, Spiritual Nutrition. 
and th those snake like looking things are what we call the nanis and the three big nanis are the Ida Pagala and then the central one you can see the white line in the center is the Shishubna through which the Kundalini flows. The key concept in spiritual nutrition is how do we in a way that maximizes the flow in the three main nadis. And what I discovered in working with people over the years, really since 1976, so that's quite a while, uh, is that meat, fish, chicken, and dairy uh, clog the nadis, slow down the flow of the kundalini. 80% life with vegan diet maximizes the flow of the kundalini. So that's it. And then we have the balance of the two wings of the right and left side of the brain. And you can see the uh, old as kind of a, a center point of that. But it's, it's a model of how our uh, subtle system works, assumes the flow of energy, and helps you begin to understand how we don't want to clog the bodies and how we want to eat in a way that amplifies and supports the flow of the kundalini or ruach energy in our subtle channels therefore enhancing our uh, spiritual power and awakening uh, and ultimately our liberation process next slide incidentally that's not a caduceus you see uh, the caduceus is only one snake the, this is the Eden of Pagali. Now here we are is the chakra system and you see there's different petals. And in each petal, there's a thought form. And they're called vertis. And the whole idea is to eat and live and also yoga sun in a way that activates and balances these vertis so that we're kind of fully functioning on the thought form levels. Next slide. So one of the most important uh, parts of this kind of overall understanding is the, what we call ojas. The ojas is the deep primordial life force and reserve that we're uh, born with and can build as well. Uh, in the Chinese system, they call it jing. So, the whole idea that there's a way is to eat in a way that builds and replenishes the ojas. So we're going to take a look at those foods so you can get a feeling for that. So next slide, please. So uh, what we're looking at is ways to build the ojas, okay? Uh, dharmic living, living in harmony, getting enough sleep, we need approximately seven hours, when we go to six hours, even though we may feel okay, research shows no, we're not quite as sharp. Our mind isn't quite as clear, okay? So that's important. Sexual balance is important. And overall balance in our lifestyle, also uh, protection from outer uh, forces. Remember I mentioned about uh, being able to protect your mind. So. A little bit of outer media is, is good, but too much, as I think people are getting today, particularly with the lockdown. It was interesting today, the United Nations, actually, the World Health Organization, actually came out and said this, uh, this lockdown is, uh, the, the, it's the cure is worse than the problem. So they're recommending ending the lockdown. That will be a big boon to everybody's health and well-being. That's another discussion, but I'm trying to make a point here is balance in our lives and our lifestyle does make a difference. Now, if we look at the left column, you can see foods that are very good for building ojas. One is the long chain omega threes, particularly the DHA. It's really, really good to have about 1200 
of DHA and about four to 600 of EPA in your diet on a daily basis. It builds brain function, builds clarity of mind, helps the thinking process, and overall helps the whole nervous system. A plant-based protein. One mistake that people make on a vegan diet is they don't get enough protein. Now, people vary. There's, as I write in my books, there's people that need a lot more protein and people need a lot less. The people that need a lot more are called fast oxidizers and they need maybe up to 70 grams of protein a day. Slow oxidizers like myself, uh, 35 grams. I'll give you an example though, because uh, you really have to get the right amount. So a few years ago, I, I was doing about 25 chin-ups and I couldn't see to go any higher. And then I looked at, oh wow, if you're 65, you actually need more protein. So I added one tablespoon of blue green algae and I jumped to, well, really up to 100 push-ups, sit-ups, sorry, thousand push-ups, but a uh, uh, hundred pull-ups uh, at one time. And that had to do with the right protein amount for my constitution at my age. That's the key. There's a little bit of variable. In middle ages, men need uh, less protein. If they're having too much, they increase uh, their rate of cancer uh, fourfold and mortality by twofold. So you have to get the right amount. Mostly people are having too much protein. You really need just between 35 and 70 grams a day. It's called the mTOR pathway. M and then capital T, capital O, capital R. What is that? That's the longevity pathway and anti-cancer pathway. So in that pathway, it's between 35 and 70 grams is all we should have. Again, most people are having too much protein, particularly if you eat a lot of meat, fish or chicken or dairy. So that's something to be really aware of. Bee pollen is a tremendous OJAS building food. It's, it's the semen of the plant world, really. Uh, Blue-green algae is very powerful, chlorella, spirulina. Coconut oil is a very high OJAS food. It's probably one of the best. It's also a way to build cholesterol. We'll talk about that at the end because uh, people are worried about cholesterol. The different seeds, hemp seeds and mm -hmm. avocados <coughs> are all really good. I talked too much, it kind of fixed my throat a little bit. So there's certain herbs that are really good. I did mention I would talk to Bottomby. Uh, and one of them is Rishi, another one is uh, ginseng and maca, rhodiola, uh, goji berries is one of the top three longevity herbs on the planet, along with uh, Rishi and ginseng. Those are your top three. Uh, Astragalus, Cassandra balances all 12 meridians. The gynostibnia is, a, again, a very important longevity herb. So these are what I call tonic herbs. And they're things you can take a little bit over a long period of time that support your, uh, your overall longevity and sense of well-being. So what, uh, so now we're looking at, this is what builds just what depletes just too much sex, uh, not enough sleep, uh, too much play, too much work, drug use, uh, definitely depletes it as well. So that's kind of an overview of uh, not so much the diet, but of certain foods that really build the ojas, which again is your deep primordial life force. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the probable animal flesh. Remember the nadis I talked about? And animal flesh blocks the flow of the kundalini in the nadis. And it disrupts the koshas, which I haven't mentioned. These are the layers of the mind. It disrupts the mental thinking. 
and it brings the energy of death into the chakras and, and also into the layers of the mind and ultimately blocks the flow of the kundalini energy this is one of the main reasons that in the east they uh people focused on the spiritual life the yogic life uh strongly recommend no animal products because it does block the flow of the kundalini next slide please okay so tom Sedison had it right the chief function of the body is to carry the brain around we do need to protect our brain function. It's actually quite important. That's what this is about. So next slide. So one of the problems with brain function is called inflammation. Gluten, high carbohydrate diets tend to increase brain inflammation. There are many things that do it, but dietary wise, these are your, your two big players. Next slide. Okay, so, and the Alzheimer, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, very interesting. They found that uh, older people eating a high carbohydrate diet at nearly four times the risk of mild cognitive impairment, which is like a pre-Alzheimer's, okay? And people who are having healthy fats, and to me that's animal, uh, plant fats, were 42% less likely to experience cognitive impairment. So the fear of, of fat may be displaced, but that's animal fat that does cause a problem. But plant fat is safe. Well, plant fat, we're talking about avocados, and the omega-3s from different sources, and things like that. Coconut oil also. So keep that in mind, though. It's... Uh, four times the risk of cognitive impairment if we're eating a lot of carbohydrates, which tends to be what people do, do in our society. Next slide. Now, blood sugar is a big problem. People generally are having too much sugar in their diet, and that means fructose or glucose. They're all a problem, and when as I say, when blood sugar goes up, fructose or glucose neurotransmitters go down. And part of the healing process I do, I work with a lot of people upgrading their mental functioning. Okay. And sugar, getting sugar out of the diet makes a huge, huge difference. If we want to naturally upgrade the key neurotransmitters, serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, GABA, dopamine. Uh, these are all really important for our overall brain clarity function. And what, what I've also found is that people on my food uh, generally uh, increase and bring their neurotransmitters into balance. So that's very important. Got to make the brain work right. Next slide. Okay, now the cholesterol question is uh, really important. People are very afraid of cholesterol, uh, but the truth is the study in Boston found that people with the highest cholesterol scored higher on cognitive tests than those with lower cholesterol. Now, why is that important? Well, we, it's important to move away from the cholesterol fear. So what we've seen uh, what I write about in my books is that cholesterol between 160 and 260 is really safe. Now, they also found that women with a cholesterol of even 270 live 28% longer than women with the cholesterol less than 193. So it's probably good to stop worrying about cholesterol if you're just doing the kind of diet I'm talking about. Don't, you're not going to have to worry about having a high cholesterol. So that's something to kind of let go of. The research does not, research the last 30 years does not support uh, cholesterol fear. Next slide. So what we heard is high cholesterol is associated with better memory function, but also overall better brain function as well. So this is, a, I'm adding this is kind of a tip in terms of how diet affects the mind 
and it really affects spiritual life. You know, I, I kind of learned this at Columbia Medical School. And we saw that people with low cholesterol had much higher rates of depression. That's how I kind of got on to understanding that. Because you need cholesterol to make certain uh, of the neural hormones. Next slide. So we come back to kind of a holistic uh, understanding of this whole process is it is about a lifestyle in which an 80% live food diet, 100% vegan, uh, one where we incorporate exercise and fasting. I like to juice fasting for a week, twice a year, uh, where we do flexibility with the yoga, as well as strengthening exercises. Very, very important, okay? Service and charity with joy is another way of increasing our overall life force. Working with the spiritual teacher if you're ready, not everybody is. Uh, and meditating as much as possible. I recommend if people could do an hour twice a day, that's great. If you can do a half hour twice a day, that's also really good. And as much Shakti Pot, Hani Ha, Awakening of the Kudamini as possible. So those are kind of the six foundations, and they help us create a quiet mind that can help us transcend the mind. So that's kind of the kind of overall picture of the teaching of how our lifestyle, and that's what I call it the holistic way, uh, greatly amplifies our spiritual life, as well as our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health. So that's a, a summary, and now I believe we have a half hour for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Gabriel. That was wonderful, um, and I'm sure we are going to have a spirited Q&A. So the first question is, I enjoyed the character building part of your presentation. Do you think this point is emphasized enough in American New Age circles? No. <laughs> That's part of the problem. You know, and what I'm giving you is the traditional Eastern and Western, you know, biblical and also yoga traditions. That's the foundation. When you have the foundation, then you can build your spiritual life. It is not emphasized enough. Do whatever you feel like is more... Uh, it's more the, the the tendency. Yes, there's uh there's not a lot of structure to the new age teachings right now, and right. um, I too believe that you need to pick a path. You need to pick a well worn path if you really want to make uh, spiritual progress. All right here's another question: Do you believe that medical specialties prevent Western doctors from proper properly analyzing symptoms? which they then treat to the detriment of the entire body system. Well, absolutely. Uh, that's called holistic health versus allopathic. Okay. I, I have been in that position since medical school in the 60s. Uh, you miss the big picture all the time and focus on the symptoms and then create a, a, a symptom approach rather than a whole person approach. I've had a couple dear friends go through the system as it is. And the other thing that I've noticed is the specialty doctors don't communicate with one another. So the patient then ends up ping ponging from one specialist to the other. Each specialist is, do, is doing tests and, and diagnoses based on his area, his or her area of specialty. But then, yeah, there's nobody coordinating the full patient picture. And I just, would you talk a little bit more about functional medicine? And I know it's been a hard uphill battle to get this um, becoming more mainstream, but is it even main, mainstream yet? Okay, so let me tell you an experience I had as a medical student, okay, in the 60s. Uh, I was a third medical student on the ward, and there was this lady. She'd been at uh, five different hospitals in New York City. They didn't know what to do with her. 
Did she have an endocrine disorder? Was it a pituitary disorder? Nobody was able to help. So here I am, this lowly third year medical student. And I did the unusual thing. I actually talked to her rather than look at the metal tech, medical test. And she was depressed, psychotically depressed. So as a medical student, I couldn't quite, uh, let's say, take that position. Everybody else wanted to see her as a uh, series of lab tests. So I brought in a psychiatric consultant. I remember his name, Dr. Mezikoff. He did a brilliant interview and diagnosed her as psychotic depressed. They treated her for psychotic depression and she got better. She'd been going like this for years. That's where I said, wait, something's wrong here. We have to take a more holistic picture. We have to see the person, and then we can fit the lab test into that. Now, at that time, there wasn't even the word holistic medicine, to be honest with you. Uh, but over time, more and more doctors have moved into that uh, realm of seeing things they call integrative medicine. Holistic is more, has a more spiritual component. In this case, this is more mental and spiritual uh, issue. I didn't know those words in the minutes. I just saw, hey, this lady's depressed. You know, mm -hmm. you're missing the diagnosis. Okay, so slowly, slowly, there is more interest in a holistic approach. And I, and I uh, as a vice president of the uh, HEMA, Arizona Holistic Medical Association. You know, there's a growing strength and movement that uh, is happening. But there's a constant struggle with the allopathic world because you're talking about taking on the pharmacies and you're talking mm -hmm. about the whole allopathic approach versus a holistic approach, which is not pharmaceutically based. Strong power and money with that. So that struggle's been going on for a while. But in my observation, slowly, slowly, there's more uh, discussion and talk about having a holistic approach. Uh, I'll just put it that way. And as a, as a follow-up, do you think some of the um, like fatigue syndromes, do you think those are the result of physicians, again, just treating symptoms and not really looking at the whole body system? Because it just seems like there are many, many more of those sorts of disorders now that fall in the rheumatoid or the rheumatism uh, category, inflammatory category. So do you think that's also the result of not looking at the whole body? Uh, well, I mean, it's not the result, but their lack of success is not looking at the whole body. Okay, if you're going to eat a lot of gluten, if you're gluten sensitive, you know, the physician didn't create that, but they misdiagnose it and they don't see the whole picture. So like live food is very anti-inflammatory. So that's part of what happens. Uh, 95% of the people I see with osteoarthritis heal just be, be putting in a diet, no medication. So uh, I think it's moving towards a way of seeing the role of diet. When I was in medical school, diet, what does that have to do with anything? Mm -hmm. I think people are at least making the words that diet is important. So it's a, it's a slow uh, transition over years, but I think it really is happening. You know? And I think there's uh, more and more physicians who are actually seeing a diet does play a role. All right, so that, now we want you to put your rabbi hat on because this question says, in Kabbalistic teachings, Yesod is the realm above Malkuth, Earth, that can block higher energies and also filters them. To what extent are seekers being confused by Yesod adding to spiritual misunderstanding? Well, you're really talking about the tree of life, okay? And you showed, which I think that's what you're talking about, is right above Melchut. But the real work is merging uh, Melchut with zero pin, the sacred masculine with the sacred feminine. That's broken down in our society, and that's really what needs to be repaired with the male-female energies uh, act more complementary rather than adversely. And that is, let's say, the bigger breakdown. Mm -hmm. The show is 
spiritual force and, as they say, sexuality. But that's just at the bottom of this whole picture where we need to have that unity of the sacred male and sacred female becoming one. Are you, are you familiar with the Kabbal Yin? Because the first teaching in the Kabbal Yin is the law of gender. I'm just curious if you're familiar with that text. It's a, an old ancient hermetic text, supposedly. That really, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. It's a similar point. They say that that's the first law and that basically Malkut isn't, we haven't even integrated the law of gender yet. I mean, right. that's how elementary things still are on this planet. Okay, here's a question. What are some of the best plant source proteins? Oh, so there's a whole range, but your nuts and seeds in general, and then uh, the plant source extracts of those nuts and seeds, hemp seed protein, black seed protein, a, a, a variety of those. Maca is also a good source of protein. Now, believe it or not, to, uh, the cruciferous vegetables have a certain amount, but the highest are going to be your nuts and seed plant source protein. Of course, you have spirulina uh, and blue green algae, which is about 60% protein and about 90% assimilated. So those are probably the most potent uh, plant source proteins and most concentrated. Now, meat, fish, and chicken uh, are really 16, 17, and 18 percent protein. So they're not all that high. So when we talk about 60 percent, it, wow. it's a, a significant difference. That is significant. Okay, here's a question. How do you feel about organic versus GMO foods? Well, the result of GMO foods is actually pretty disastrous. Uh, the research shows it increases type 2 diabetes, increases rates of cancer, and increases rates of uh, heart disease, really all chronic diseases. Uh, it's an aberration. It's not the way God put it together, and it shows up. It's not really compatible. But if you look at all the chronic diseases, we, we see for sure GMO uh, foods uh, have a much higher incidence of, of uh, those diseases. People have a higher amount of, of the GMO diet. Let me ask a follow-up to that. So my limited knowledge of agriculture, um, weren't new strains of foods created by grafting and in that sense genetically modifying foods so is it across the board position you would take with gmo foods or are there instances where you know they're they're basically making that plant more hardy and for arid climates or they're they're tweaking the genetics for reasons that would allow the food to grow better so we're really talking two separate things gmo food is not what you're talking about but you are actually talking about uh uh, taking a, a different strains and crossbreeding them. That's not GMO. That's still within the natural realm to get more hardy, you know, for that area and so forth. So that is still natural. Okay. GMO is not natural. It's an aberration. Our gene system and our bodies don't really recognize the GMO, and that's why we have more disease. What you're talking about, people have been doing for thousands of years, which is the crossbreeding of plants cross-fertilization, which is uh, still within the natural realm and still works as natural. Okay. Yes, but I've been wondering about the distinction. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, here's a question. I have been told that the ideal pH level in the human body is 7.4 on the scale. Most of us have acidic pH levels. How important is the high alkaline waters to support the body to be in the healthier range and what foods are best to move us into more alkaline state? Okay, that's a good question. So the range, okay, is 6.4 to 7.2. Now, what are we talking about? There's pH of your blood, there's pH of your urine, there's pH of your lymph. We are talking about pH of your urine. Okay, that's because that's easy to measure. First urine in the morning. Okay. okay, that being said, 
the optimum urine pH is 6.4 and 7.2. Now, most people are acidic. So you want to move towards a more alkaline diet. Uh, one of the problems with alkaline water is you can get too alkaline too quickly uh, or just too alkaline. And that causes other problems. So it's good to maybe, if you're very acidic, to use alkaline water for a short time, six weeks, three months. But better is to go towards an alkalizing diet, which is your fruits and vegetables. That's the better approach, because that's more sustainable. Okay. What you're saying? As, um, yeah, I have a question for you as a woman who's over 50, by a lot at this point. Um, in your books, or, or is there one of your books that would address for me and my age group um, issues that older women need to be thinking about in their diet? I mean, as we get older, our bodies change. You kind of addressed this a little bit in the talk, but I'm just curious if you could... Um, Tell us if there's one of your books that talks about how older women should maybe modify their diet. So not, not as specific, but generally you want to eat less. That's the first thing. Because it's really easy after menopause to gain weight. I'm sure you've noticed that with a lot of women. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is is to eat high serotonin foods. <clears throat> now, that's not so easy. And what we see post-menopause, there's an increase in depression. There's an increase, in, I'm gonna call it angst, just not feeling right. There's decreased sexual energy. And what happens post-menopause is the serotonin production goes down. So when we're eating like food, that itself really does help up the serotonin production. But I've also insomnia. It's another symptom of mm -hmm. increased serotonin. I found that uh, tryptophan, uh, it's an amino acid, is... Uh, in many, many, many cases, uh, we, it, it converts to serotonin, can really readjust that. So that those symptoms of the angst, the depression, and the insomnia uh, go away. So that's probably the most single, most powerful, effective thing I've seen. Uh, not getting sleep is a big problem, okay? But and also not having enough serotonin. So all that is uh, in many, many women is alleviated with the uh, adding uh, tryptophan in the diet. You can't get a lot of tryptophan in the diet in the vegan diet. Tryptophan's in turkey, it's in some pumpkin seeds, but it's not a lot. So it's easier to take a little bit of a supplement. So that, that leads into the next question in my mind. How do you feel about supplements? Or do you think generally we should be getting the nutrients from food itself? What, what's your take on supplements? If we, if we lived 200 years ago, I'd say you should get it from your food. What we're facing today is the soils are depleted. The foods have far less uh, nutrients in them than they used to. Uh, and so I'm seeing almost everyone needs some supplementation because of the depleted soils and the uh, intense uh, environmental kind of stresses that everybody feels. Uh, and stress itself, which is different than an environmental stress, actually uses up a whole lot more nutrients, B vitamins. So I'm finding that most everybody at this point because of what I just said, does need some supplements. Wow. Oh, but now, we're talking now. 
Yeah, I had um, the privilege of going to Al Gore's Climate Underground last year. And the minute you said that, I remembered they, they were emphasizing that heavily, how much, how less, uh, how less the soil is containing nutrients that are growing better food. I mean, it, we're going in the, we're going, absolutely going in the wrong direction. So I'm really glad I asked. And I think we had a follow-up. I'm looking at the Q&A, a follow-up question about supplements. Um, okay, actually, it was about meditation. Okay, what is the recommended daily meditation time for optimal balancing and grounding? And is a guided meditation better than just meditating in silence? Okay, so everybody goes at different rates. I, you know, optimally, if you could do an hour twice a day, that would be very good. Most people don't quite make enough time to do that. I think if people do a half hour twice a day, that's enough time to go into deeper levels of meditation. That's roughly what I recommend. It's a half hour twice a day. Uh, why twice a day, not an hour yeah. once a day? Uh, because most people's days, by the time they reach the end of the day, have been fairly disruptive, and it's, uh, so it's good to be able to meditate and get centered again. And it's always good to meditate first thing in the morning. So I, I tend to divide it up for people. So that's what I recommend. Now, meditation regenerates the whole body. We find that people who meditate literally, literally, not figuratively, regrow their brains. That was research out of Harvard. Uh, they are happier. Uh, the whole endocrine system is supported by the meditation as well. So it's an upgrade, literally increasing the size of the brain, particularly in the emotional centers. So I strongly recommend meditation, but about a half hour twice a day is, is the minimum people can use. Great. This next question, can you describe more about the Tree of Life Center and yoga and detoxification protocols, as well as the live vegan oriented farming practices and technology that you use in the communities um, or for communities at the center. Okay, so the main detox, what I find the best is the seven day juice fast. That we do with the juices in half. That's the easiest, people benefit the most, and you kind of need a cycle of seven days. 12 hours is not enough, three days is not enough. There's a whole detox cycle that takes uh, two to three days, if not four days. So I recommend uh, juice fasting uh, as the prime way to detox, like twice a year. Now, obviously, if you're doing live organic food, you have less to detox with. So the ongoing is to do that. We, I like to make it more simple for people. So if you could just uh, fast twice a year like that, that's... That's enough. And with that fasting, you take enemas and you do a whole lot of things, skin brushing, pranayama, clearing out your lungs. So that's uh, the simplest way to do it. If you can uh, set that up in your schedule, it's also a time to uh, somewhat take a break. So uh, that kind of takes care of a lot because during that time, you also get reactivated. People say, oh, God, I forgot you know, about doing yoga, meditating, and this is a reset. So it's a uh, spiritual reset is, well, at least the way we do it, because we do meditate twice a day. It's a spiritual reset as well as a physiological reset. And so it activates the vital life force. And that's kind of the key. So that's the single, simple way, 100% vegan, plant source only diet, 80% live food, ongoing, and fasting twice a year. I want to make it simple, not complex. So this is it's simple, but probably the most effective thing I've seen. I've seen, I've tried longer fasts, you know, 40-day fast. But as an ongoing thing, this is uh, the most powerful and, in a sense, simple, elegant way to approach all those questions. And I'm assuming you offer those week-long fasting retreats at your center, correct? Right. Well, at this point, of course, <laughs> yeah, we do. Right now. 
uh, in a week we're going to start a fast, you know, so we're, we're, we switch to the internet. Uh, okay. <clears throat> we do offer up, well, again, everything's changed, but we have uh, particularly been offering them on a regular basis in Israel. Uh, and, but again, you can't do that. So we're doing it over the internet and it seems to work just fine. We have a, a fast coming up. Well, we have a meditation starting on the 18th of this month, three days, and then we go into a fast for seven days. So it's a guided fast over the internet. So uh, it's so a next big experiment, but it works. People really do get good results. Well, that's wonderful. Um, this question is from Stephen. Is there a difference in the energy level of live food grown hydroponically, hydroponically versus in soil? It's a good question. Uh, I've observed and kind of looking at it and playing with these ideas uh, that when it's grown in soil, it has the energy of the earth. So there, it's a more holistic energy, but proper hydroponics is pretty good too. I think soil grown is, is stronger. It's hard to measure all those things, but we have measured a little bit and we get the earth grown has is, is got more energy because it's, it's in a sense more complete with nature. Okay. So this is a follow-up question about what you do at your center regarding teaching farming practices and the holistic technologies for communities? Are you still able to do that with COVID? Well, everything has shifted. So we're really not center focused at all. Uh, we have programs in many countries. So we are teaching, for example, in Africa, we have uh, over 60 uh, holistic veganic farms in Cameroon, okay. In Liberia, we have over 20. So we've done everything going outward because people really can't come there even before COVID. So our shift has been away from here uh, mm -hmm. and towards teaching on site. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at our farmers think about 60 farms and they're having a quote food shortage. Well, they're growing their own food and that's organic organic food. So our, our focus is to support that. We're also supporting a well, uh, fresh water for people because water is a big issue, particularly in Africa. But we're, we're doing this around the world, but Africa's our big site. Uh, we're doing it in Mexico as well. So that's how we're approaching it. We're not really doing on-site training here uh, at the tree. Uh, we're really teaching people where they are. Most farmers in Africa can't afford to come to the United States. You see what I mean? So we've, we've switched our focus. And so we really are teaching here. Uh, we're teaching there, out as a way. Uh, and it's uh, far more effective. And and are your teachers able to go into um, Africa, for instance, and experiment with the soils and, and discover even better farming practices that you're able to, to teach? I mean, are you doing cutting? I'm just curious about the research that might be taking place and when you're dealing with, well, you know, very... The, the issues we face are, are like, you know, uh, people are fascinated by high tech. So we're kind of competing with mostly high tech, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical, the uh, pesticide, mm. herbicide versus organic. So we're just trying to support people doing the organic, veganic farming using uh, low cost uh, kind of uh, approaches rather than anything highly technical. And people have been growing food for a long time, so it's not that complicated. It's not that difficult. Yeah. Okay, here's our next question. What is your opinion of cold exposure as a therapy to reduce inflammation? 
build immunity, and or support general health? You have to be a little careful. I like hot, cold, hot, cold type situation. It stimulates the thing, but too much cold can actually shock the system. So there has to be a balance there. Okay. I don't want, I don't want cold therapy, I know. <laughs> I'd rather go on the warm side, but anyway, that's just me. Um, let's see, is there, are there any other questions? That might have been our last question. So if so, do you have any parting thoughts you want to leave with our audience about um, just how, how this sector, health and wellness, intersects with others in building the new world? So the new world for me is going back to the old ways that really did work with more sophistication. People did used to eat organic, okay, before the 30s. So we want to go back to organic. That was a big, uh, being organic was a, a, moving away from organic was a big downshift in terms of quality of health. So let's go back to organic. Let's go back to kind of organic ways of farming and organic ways of eating. Those are important. Exercise is important. Meditation is important. There's nothing new about that. So mm -hmm. we're really returning to the old ways that kept people really holistically healthy. Uh, the, the big issue is uh, because it's technical doesn't make it better. So. Right. My, my focus is on the natural way of living and eating that people have lived for thousands of years that supports the liberation process. Where mm -hmm. I'm adding to it is focusing on the liberation process with meditation, with yoga, tai chi, chi gong, kind of adding to the natural ways that people have been doing for so long. Okay, go back to the natural ways. That's what's missing because we've been kind of seduced by thinking, if it's technical, it's better. It's mm -hmm. not turning out to be that way. So my message is go back to a natural way of living, eating. Uh, we didn't talk about sacred relationship. That's another whole topic. But uh, seeing God in each other, these are kind of basics. Uh, and then we begin to bring our society back into some level of unity. When I talked about uh, the Reiki, you know, it's like, can we see God equally in everybody? That's kind of basic, but is that what's happening in our society? And so, but you can't do that until you see God within yourself. So when we meditate and we experience the light of the divine within ourselves, we can see that in other people. So when we go back to those kind of basic way of living that people have done for thousands of years, our society's going to come back into order then we can add the technical. By going technical in a way that forgets the basics, that's how we've gotten into trouble. And of course, bottom line, we turn to God. If uh, right now we're not returning to God, we're going the other way. And no society has really done that well when we uh, stop focusing on the divine within ourselves and within other people. So that's what I'm recommending is return to God as number one and then all the natural ways that uh, I'm going to say God given ways that we be given throughout the ages. It isn't that hard. That's why I call it kind of a holistic way of life uh, because it includes everything, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual on uh, kind of all parameters. So if we begin to evoke, I'm going to use the word arrows. Eros is the passion for God and all that we're doing. And when we start returning to that, we have a lot more joy in life, a lot more happiness, and it helps us blossom as human beings. So that's my blessing. May everyone return to the passion and joy in life as we move back into the natural ways of living Oh, yeah. and I just want to say that I think you're right. This sector, more than any other, 
that moving forward, building the new world really means returning to ancient wisdom. I mean, I would, as, when you started the answer by saying that, it really struck me that this is the one sector where we almost have to have a retrospective approach or we're not going to build the new world. So thank you for that insight. Um, really good point. Can, can you indulge me with one last question? Sure. We're building a community here and um, we've had some people come through recently who are really into hallucinogenic plant medicine. And as a, a rabbi, as someone who's obviously um, a devout uh, seeker of both truth and light, would you leave us with your impression of those who would use drugs to reach altered states, whether that's a good idea or not? <laughs> that's the last question. That's at least a two hour answer. But uh, okay. Uh, so one of the things I do, and I've been doing, doing since the 60s, okay, so we got 60 years of doing this, is helping people uh, recover from hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, we call it psychosis or transcendence, uh, but the drugs push people more into psychosis. The other thing that happens is, as most ayahuasca leaders in, in South America will tell you, there's a lot of entities that people pick up, okay? So all these things are happening and uh, part of my work, really in the last 10 years, has been mostly seeing people who, uh, I mean, not, they're not the only clinics, but mostly it's ayahuasca people with Kundalini awakening and, and, and they're scrambled. And it takes a little work to undo all that goes on. So that's one level. Uh, I've been actually working with these issues, again, since the 60s. So I have more than a little bit of experience in it. So it takes us to another question, which is the foundations for spiritual life. So what are the foundations? The six foundations work. They may not be as fast, but they're solid. What I find is that people uh, go with a, a drug hit. They may get an insight. They may go psychotic, but they may get also an insight. And, but they haven't earned it. And so you're stuck with either, hey, take another hit of LSD or whatever else uh, to keep getting maybe some insight or go back to the natural ways, the six foundations, and build your foundation so you're steady in your spiritual life. And that's really the, the key difference. Uh, build your foundation so this is your natural way of being. Uh, it, this what I don't even call altered. It's a higher state of being that you can touch into with LSD. But the truth is, that's only the astral plane levels. The levels I'm talking about are way beyond astral plane in terms of awareness. So the drugs tend to limit you to an astral plane experience, which actually is counter to spiritual evolution. So uh, I'm going to put it that way. Uh, and I won't go too much into it except to say, when you're doing the natural, you naturally evolve way beyond the natural plane. And in my book, Nothing, you know, I actually discuss the issues, but you don't mm. go into the nothing with drugs. You go into the, uh, a variation of something in the astral plane primarily. Does it mean you can't occasionally hit going into nothing? Well, that can happen but it's not the dominant thing. So better to build your foundation so you're regularly in nothing. And then meditate twice. I said, I, I'm into nothing a lot, okay, uh, <laughs> to be honest. But that's because it's something that there's been a slow and steady transformation over years of meditation. Does that make sense? It makes sense sense and I wholeheartedly agree with you and I'm really glad I asked that as the last question because it's been coming up a lot lately. Now um, I'm, I'm going to add one more thing. I actually mm -hmm. 
find a lot of people who do a lot of the drugs do get brain damage. The research is out there about it. I have a whole set of slides about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do tend, there's a tendency that, to get brain damage with all the different drugs. So I'll, I'll kind of mention that, and I, I can see it when people, because you know, I've, so many people from around the world come to me when they've been damaged from these things. So I'm, yeah, that, I'm that's a risk in the problem. Yeah. Really great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gabriel. I mean, we, this was so much more than, you know, bodily health and wellness with, with your background. Um, this was just lovely. Thank you so much for this well-rounded total body, mind, spirit presentation. Thank you. Okay, Laura, it's great to work with you. You did great questions and may you and all your work in your whole group be blessed and continue to support the evolution of humanity. Uh -huh. Om Jai. Good night. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you on Wednesday with uh, another two presentations in the Building the New World Conference. Thank you for joining us. Good night.